Hello and welcome to a very, very, very happy Recap Sunday here on the Big Recon on Sports Podcast. I am your host, I am the Big Recon, and it has finally happened. The last time the team that I wear this evening was in the playoffs, my son was not alive. The last time this team made the playoffs, Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake had just broken up. The last time this team made the playoffs, I had hair. That's right, today with a 24-22 win over the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Cleveland Browns secured their first postseason appearance since the 2002 season. What a long road it has been. 19 seasons since this team sniffed playoff football. There's a lot to break down with today's game. So this episode is going to take a little while because we are going to start on Friday night. I know when I came to you Friday afternoon with that CFP preview, I didn't really go into the Alabama game because that went exactly as we thought. A 31-14 win by Alabama. Devontae Smith, Mac Jones, and Najee Harris had huge days, including Najee Harris jumping over a dude who's like 6'2". But the nightcap was the game I thought would be the better game, and it turns out it wasn't. Why wasn't it? Because the Buckeyes took Clemson to the woodshed and made them say uncle. Those aren't my words. Those are the words of Desmond Howard from ESPN, who also, by the way, went to that school up north. So how did it happen? Well, let's start with how the game started. Buckeyes win the toss. They defer like they always do. Trevor Lawrence has the offense zooming, and they are using the outside where Ohio State's been susceptible all season. So... First drive, straight down, seven points, done. Ohio State, three and out. I'm sitting here on my chair going, mmm, this ain't good. The defense stepped up. They got a stop of their own, and the man who carried them to a Big Ten championship, Trey Sermon, broke one for 32 yards, which, by the way, he wasn't touched. No touch. No yards after contact. No one hit him. He didn't break any tackles. He was gone. Why? Here's why. Ohio State figured out that they needed to make sure Clemson didn't get their calls in and started playing with some tempo. Justin Fields engineered that first, the second drive, excuse me, the first scoring drive with absolute perci- precision. And it was 7-7. Well, what happened next? Clemson goes down, scores against 14-7 Clemson. Ohio State goes down and scores again to tie it. Now, this is where it gets interesting. It's 14-14 in this game at the end of the first quarter. And you're sitting here going, oh, it's time for a shootout. Can the Bucs hang with this team that has put a lot of points up on on a good team this year in Notre Dame? Well, then Ohio State unleashed a 21-0 run in the second quarter. Capped off by one of the most beautiful passes I've seen Justin Fields throw in the two seasons I've watched him, to Jeremy Ruckert in the back of the end zone, threw a defender. This was a this was an NFL throw. This was into a bread box of a window, and this had speed, and it was right on his hands. This was a beautiful throw. This is after, for the second year in a row, a player in the semifinal from one of these two teams gets thrown out for targeting as James Skalski gets tossed after an epic hit on Justin Fields. Now, for everybody who asks a question about, oh, targeting, was it worth it? You have to remember, in college, it's not a helmet-to-helmet hit. It is a lowering of the head and leading with the crown of the helmet that determines if the hit was targeting or not. This was the same hit Shazier put on a player from Cincinnati that Shazier's no longer able to play. It's the same hit. So, for everybody who was screaming, oh, it's a garbage call, it wasn't. It was classic targeting. It was leading with the crown of the helmet into the player. That's targeting. That's an illegal play in college football. After that, Ohio State dominated the second quarter. Fields got up off the deck and threw a 10-yard touchdown to Chris Olave, his favorite target he missed. And then in the second half, they played even. It was 14-14 in the second half. But the two times Ohio State scored in the second half, both of them on some serious bombs. The first one traveled 61 yards in the air to Chris Olave in the end zone. 
for the first touchdown of the second half. After Fields threw an interception to start the second half. Because Ohio State scored that last touchdown in the second quarter with 20 seconds left in the half. And got the ball to start the second half. Fields has... They march right down the field. Guy gets a thumb on a ball, flutters down, Clemson intercepts it. Really not a whole lot you can do about that. Ohio State holds. Go down the field. Fields hits Olave. Now, mind you, he's using his whole body and torques himself with this throw to throw it that far in the air. So you get thinking, how bad is he really hurt? Well, pretty bad. There was a doctor who did a thing online who basically said, if he doesn't have broken ribs, he's lucky. That's how hard he got hit. My first question was, why is he not wearing a flak jacket? Like all these other boys do. But then again, Drew Brees just had 11 broken ribs, and I guess that kind of happens. So it takes us into the fourth quarter with Ohio State clinging to a three-score lead. Well, guess what? They made it four scores real quick. A 49-28 to beatdown of the number two team in the country. Last year, when Clemson beat Ohio State 29-23, it could be argued that Ohio State was the better team on the field and just didn't get a couple of calls. Not only was Ohio State the better team on the field, they got the calls this year. The targeting call was one of them. A questionable fumble by Trevor Lawrence was another. And an upholding of an interception by Trevor Lawrence to end Clemson's night was the third. I say questionable. A uh, guy caught it in the end zone, came down, foot hit the ground, but before he could finish the catch, an Ohio State defensive back slapped it out of his hand. Seven Banks was there to catch it, and he took off the other way. If I'm not mistaken, it, no, it wasn't into the same end zone. But it looked a lot like Tyvis Powell intercepting um, Blake Sims at the end of the 2015 Sugar Bowl that Ohio State beat Alabama. So here we are. A week from tomorrow, Monday night, January 11th, from Hard Rock Stadium in Miami, Florida, Ohio State will play Alabama for the right to have a national championship. Both teams winning their games handily, one being more impressive than the other. Now, Alabama did what they were supposed to do. They beat a Notre Dame team that, quite honestly, you could make the argument didn't belong in there. But uh, Notre Dame had the best win of the year over everybody until the playoff. That win by Ohio State, I was floored. I picked them to win. I picked a 34-31 score. I thought it would be a little high scoring. I thought the Bucs would get a couple of plays down the stretch to get it done. They held Clemson under 30. They held Clemson under 30. And here's the two stats that people aren't talking about. Travis Etienne, 10 carries, 32 yards. Trevor Lawrence was unable to run the ball out of the backfield because Ohio State's defensive line was dominant. They pushed around the Clemson O-line like it was nobody's business. They finally, toward the end of the game, when they had the big lead, they let Jonathan Cooper and Baron Browning and Isaiah Smith go after Lawrence, and they got to him a few times, including forcing a fumble. This was the most complete game I have seen Ohio State play since the 62-39 beatdown of Michigan two years ago. They've had issues in some phase of the game in every other game that I've seen. They've played very well, but they've had an issue. There was no issues in this game. None. Outside of a a kickoff that went out of bounds, this team was on fire. Ryan Day in this program had 29-23 Clemson all over the weight room. All over the facility. They prepared for the Sugar Bowl from the minute the Fiesta Bowl was over last year until they walked into the Dome Friday night. And they put it on them. It, uh, oh, they put it on them. Trey Sermon, again, nearly 200 yards rushing. Another Ohio State record of over 500 yards in the last two games. 524. The 331 against Northwestern. The 193 against Clemson. And the thing about his 193, a lot of it was before contact. That O-line was pushing people around that easily that he had a bunch of yards before contact. It was close to half. But then he started breaking tackles in the second half and they just took over. 
They grinded out this win at the end like you're supposed to when you have a good running attack. So what's this set up? Well, next Sunday night, I will bring you a college football playoff national championship preview. Um, won't be alive. It'll be just recorded and I'll post it. But this is going to be a great game. You're talking about two offenses who are averaging nearly one over 45 points and one just below 45 points a game for the year. You're talking about two quarterbacks that are playing at the top, uh, the highest of levels because I'm going to go into Justin Fields in just a minute. You're talking about each team having a speed burner at wide receiver who can change a game just by his route running and his speed in Chris Olave and Devontae Smith. You have running backs who are hitting the holes and getting yards after contact like Najee Harris and Trey Sermon. Mind you, Ohio State was without 16 players due to COVID restrictions on Friday. If they are at full strength, this game against Alabama is going to be an absolute... It's either going to be... They're going to run the score up, either team. Or this is going to be one of those games where you sit there scratching your head going, am I ever going to see a college game as good as this again? That's what I expect on Monday, January the 11th. So let's dive into Justin Fields. 22 of 28 for 385 yards, six touchdowns, and one interception. That's the one where the ball was tipped. Notice something about those numbers. He had as many incompletions as he did touchdowns. That is not something you see or are supposed to see in a college playoff. Not against a team that has been in the national championship game however many times since in the last few years. Not against a team that, well, was playing against number 11, according to their coach. Man, they let Dabo have it all over Twitter. I was tweeting most of the night. I, listen, I had two nights in a row up past midnight. I haven't done that. Maybe since the last time the Browns were in the playoffs. But I have <laughs> it was epic this game. I, I was sitting in my chair, just I was it wasn't it was almost unbelievable. I knew this team was good. I knew they also lost some things in the offseason going to the NFL that were going to hurt. But this team and this quarterback, I mean, he was outstanding. I don't give um Athletes aren't heroes to me. Um, they can be who you want to model yourself after, as far after as far as you're a player, or if you know model yourself as a good citizen like LeBron, who I mentioned. Um, but no, it, it, this was some. They called it hero ball on ESPN, and ESPN who hates the Big Ten for them to say something like that. That's pretty good. Fields was outstanding, and. Mark Sanchez made a good point, and I know that name and good points don't usually go together, but Mark Sanchez made a great point. After Fields got hurt, he had to play quarterback. He had to use his checkdowns. He had to make sure he went through his reads because he couldn't take off and run. What a game. I mean, I just, I still can't believe it. I was watching YouTube stuff about it all day yesterday and all day today. So, that brings me back to where I started this, and that is the playoff bound, Cleveland Browns. I am wearing the Denzel Ward jersey. I think it's only fitting that the guy who went from Nordonia High School, which is an eastern suburb of Cleveland, down Route 71 to Ohio State, and then back up to the Cleveland Browns as the number four pick in the 2018 draft. It's only fitting I wear this jersey tonight. I will tell you this. I'm giving a shout-out to Baker Mayfield. Yes, that Baker Mayfield, who people said was the worst quarterback in that draft, who went number one. Yes, that Baker Mayfield, who, when his running attack was the main way they were getting things done, they said he wasn't good enough to run a franchise. That Baker Mayfield that today became just the third quarterback in history in his first three years to throw for 3,000 yards and over 20 touchdowns, joining Peyton Manning and Andrew Luck. Only three all time. So, and by the way, skipping ahead to the end, whose hand did Kevin Stefanski put the ball in when he needed that first down to ice the game? Baker Mayfield. Baker had another Baker day today. He wasn't flashy. He had a good completion percentage. He had, 
Um, he threw a couple of touchdown passes. He didn't turn the ball over today. He went for 196 yards. He threw one touchdown pass. No interceptions. His season... I mean, this is... What more can you ask from a quarterback? He went for 3,563, 26-8, and, and a 95.9 QBR. That's a good season. That's a quarterback you can build around when you have other pieces around him. So the game started off really well for the Browns. They got a stop on the Steelers' first possession. They go down. Nick Chubb breaks one, 47 yards to the house. It gets him over 1,000 yards again this season. And oh, by the way, he missed four games. Imagine what he would have done in those four games if he would have been healthy. And by the way, one of the games he missed was Pittsburgh earlier in the year. So then we get Baker moves the team down. He gets the second score, the second touchdown of the day was a drag route to Austin Hooper in the end zone. The third touchdown was on an end around from Jarvis, and Jarvis took a big shot and got into the end zone. There is some bad news. DP, uh, DPJ, Donovan Peoples-Jones, is now in concussion protocol. Don't know if he's going to play next week. But what did this game do? Well, this game brought everybody's... Um, the wishes we all had at the beginning of the year uh, come to fruition. I myself had them at 11-5 and five when I started, when I did my record break, uh, schedule breakdown, excuse me, earlier in the year. As it stands right now, next week, the Cleveland Browns will go to Pittsburgh and play the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Baltimore Ravens will go to Tennessee and play the Tennessee Titans. And the Indianapolis Colts will go to Buffalo. Yes, I said to Buffalo because the Buffalo Bills are the two seed. Way to go, Bills Mafia. The Buffalo Bills will host the Indianapolis Colts next week. So what else did this game prove to me? Well, let's see. Let's start here. It proved to me that, yes, Baker Mayfield is the guy to lead this team because in a game where he couldn't make mistakes because of how important it was, he didn't make any. He did take a sack. I think he could have thrown the ball away, but that's going to happen from time to time. Nick Chubb ran the ball well, had a, over 100 yards again. Kareem Hunt laid the block of the day. So if any of you guys want to go back and watch the final play where Baker runs for the first down on third and three, Kareem Hunt absolutely blew somebody up. I don't know if it was Minka Fitzpatrick or who it was, but he blew them up. You heard it. And it was a clean block. There was no lower in the head, none of that stuff. He just hit him. And Baker goes in, slides, doesn't go out of bounds. Huge part of that play is not going out of bounds. Baker got the job done. The defense is killing me. The Browns at one point in time were up in this game 24-9. And they held on to win 24-22. I will give Mason Rudolph credit. He threw a couple of really good he threw a couple of really good balls today. I mean, just absolute dimes into the breadbasket of uh, Chase Claypool over uh, who made a huge catch. Um, and then he had him set up a two point conversion to tie it. But the thing was, there was almost two minutes left, and Baker was getting the ball. Couldn't get the two point conversion to go. The Browns get a couple of first downs, and guess what? Ball game. And here we are, next Sunday. Oh, actually, I don't know which day yet. They haven't announced the schedule. Let's see if they have it out. NFL playoff schedule. They don't have times announced yet. Uh, Saturday, there's a 1 o'clock game and a 440 game. Oh, that's right. They added the extra game. So there's a triple header on Saturday and a triple header on Sunday. 105, 440, and 815 on Saturday. 105, 440, and 815 on Sunday. Um, 
lots of new wrinkles in this one. ESPN's getting a game. Uh, CBS, Fox, NBC are going to have games. Nickelodeon. Yes, I said Nickelodeon is actually going to be broadcasting an NFL playoff game. I don't know. I, I, they said they're going to do it with all sorts of different stuff. I don't know. I don't know if I like that. Hopefully the Browns are on one of the regular channels um, so we can get that game watched. And listen, it's the first time I'll watch a Browns playoff game since 2002. I'll be honest with you, I don't even know if I watched it then. Uh, they say played Pittsburgh. Which I find funny. They the last two times within these years, and they played Pittsburgh. Funny thing is, it's the year before Ben, or two years before Ben, and then this could be Ben's final year. So let's see what happens. So depending on when the Browns are scheduled, I will come to you with a Browns playoff preview um, the day of the game. So it's either going to be Saturday or Sunday that you'll hear from me again. Uh, not going to be live. It's just going to be posted. Um, tomorrow night... 9 p.m., Big Recon YouTube channel, Big Recon uh, Facebook page, and Periscope on Twitter. The boys are back. We're going to get into baseball tomorrow. You know, here's my final thought on what went down today. When I lived in Cleveland, which was years ago, I've been back in New York 20 years now, I lived there when Art Modell moved the team. And I remember seeing how much it affected the city. And I remember when uh, Michael White, who was the mayor at the time, went to Paul Tagliabue, who was the uh, commissioner of the NFL, and they worked out the deal that allowed the Browns' colors, the records, and everything to stay in Cleveland, making Baltimore now the Ravens. And I remember the excitement when they came back. And a 1-15 in season didn't matter. Because the Browns were back. But since that moment, my friends and family who have been Browns fans for a lot longer than me have had to live with constant losing. One, two good seasons. Where one of them... You lose out on the playoffs late in the year. The other one you get in, you get beat in the first round. What today meant to the city of Cleveland cannot be discussed without telling you that no matter how good the Cavaliers are, no matter how good the Brown, the, the Indians are, or whatever they name the team now, no matter how many times Ohio State wins a championship, Cleveland is a Browns town. Every single guy who talked about it talked about how, what it meant to the fans and what it meant to the city. And they're not wrong. As much as it pains me to say this, because I am a baseball guy, my other home is a football town. Cleveland, as go the Browns, so go Cleveland. Because if you think it was insane when the Cavaliers beat Golden State in 2016... You got another thing coming if these boys pull this off in the next within the next few years. It's going to get crazy. And I hope I see it. So, again, coming up tomorrow night, 9 o'clock, Tone and Alex will be here to discuss what's going on in the baseball hot stove. Wednesday night, um, actually, I won't have an episode for you on Wednesday. I will come to you again this weekend twice. Once with the Browns playoff preview and once with a breakdown of the college football playoff national championship game. So let's get the count going since that's what we do at the end of every episode here with what's coming up. The CFP preview was episode 95. This is 96. Tomorrow night's 97. 98 and 99 are over the weekend, which means sometime in the next two weeks, I will have to you the Big Recon 100th episode, the breakdown of the GOAT debate, and my opinion on it. It's going to take a while. It will be a live hit on all three platforms because I want to make this interactive. I want people to ask me questions. I want people to say, you're wrong, and then I tell them why I feel that way. What stats I use to break that down. As always, Big Recon can be found on YouTube, Big Recon on Sports. Facebook, Big Recon on Sports. Twitter, at Big Recon on Sport. Anchor, Google, Spotify, Breaker, Pocket Cast, Radio Public.
Sorry, Google just tried to open up when I said that. So Google Anchor, um, Spotify, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, and as a proud member of the TimeSkew Podcast Network at TimeSkew.com. I will see everyone tomorrow night at 9 o'clock. We're going to dive into baseball. I know it's January, but I need it. Uh, and the boys and I are going to bring to you what we think is going on on the hot stove and a lot of the rumors that have been happening and what we can see happening before they report to spring training less than 45 days from today. Have a great rest of your night. I can't believe I'm saying this. The next time I talk to you outside of tomorrow will be a Cleveland Browns playoff preview. Have a great rest of your night. Go dogs. OH.